Macbeth from the Pennsylvania Antiquarian Society. <laughs> So here's what we'll do. Everybody on this side of the room, just don't eat anything more. Have small portions on those little refreshment things because you need to make a statement against consumerism and so forth. You people over here, have an extra cookie. <laughs> Enjoy things because the economy and the environment and your very soul will be enriched thereby. So, go forward and enjoy things. Now, too late. Too late, right? <laughs> You've made your choices, but maybe this will change some of your minds. Is the sound okay for everybody? Is anybody being bothered by the sound? Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. And the interesting thing happened in the last year, which is that two distinguished history professors from the great neighboring state of New Jersey issued uh, books for our edification that weighed in on the financial crisis of today. What is the nature of that crisis? What are the historical roots of the crisis? And how can we best think about getting out of the crisis? And we're very lucky because both of these professors are here uh, with us tonight. And, uh, Professor James Livingston, Jim Livingston, uh, professor at Rutgers, has written this book called Against Thrift, Why Consumer Culture is Good for the Economy, the Environment, and Your Soul. And that's that would be the subject. Now, and because of a glitch in communications uh, with our, uh, the, the, through nobody, because of no one in this room, uh, we don't have books for you, for you to buy and have them signed, but we want everybody to buy the book anyway and to go to uh, me. Or where's Svetlana? You're back here. We can arrange to get you copies of this book in the most convenient possible way. Okay? Uh, the other history professor from New Jersey is Sheldon Garrett, a professor of history at Princeton University. He wrote this book. Beyond Our Means, Why America Spends While the World Saves. Now, the interesting thing about these two men and these two books is that they take different points of view. I don't know if they're diametrically opposite on every question, but let's just say they have a fundamentally different way of understanding and diagnosing the current crisis, and that's what's going to make tonight's conversation very, very interesting. So, um, we're going to... I'm going to talk to these guys for uh, a little bit, and then we're going to open it up for questions and answers, and uh, that's how we'll go. Now, I want to start with you, Jim Livingston, and just ask you briefly, uh, what were the concerns or questions that you had that caused you to want to write? Is this is on? Yes. Okay. Um, the, the first thing that happened was, um, uh, I wrote a book on, about the Federal Reserve a long time ago. Um, it came out in 1986, and it's still in print. Um, and every time some downturn in the economy uh, occurs, people buy it. It, you know, it sells like 40 copies. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so when the crisis occurred uh, in 2008, uh, I hadn't been doing economic history or economic theory for a long time. That's where I started. But I'm now much more of an intellectual historian. I got a bunch of emails from people, strangers, and also from friends saying, okay, you're the guy who wrote the book on the Fed. It's time that you stepped up, as we like to say, when we watch sports, and, and explain this. What in the hell happened? So, uh, I have this little blog. I wrote uh, a two-part uh, piece uh, at the blog on this, and then I uh, sent it to a couple of friends, and then the thing went viral, just it went, it went everywhere. Um, it, it appeared at the History News Network, and then, but it, you know, at the Atlantic, uh, American Prospect, the Republic, it was all, they were excerpted or, you know, all right, so, uh, and that uh, caused an agent to get in touch with me to say, why don't you write a book? And, I, and my immediate response, of course, was, uh, well, I don't do that anymore. You know, that, I don't do economic history. But I thought, well, this is an opportunity because, as we all know, 
uh, even the economist, the uh, syllabus for the CEO said, says we need a paradigm shift. We need a change of mindset uh, because the economists blew it uh, on the way down, and the economists are still blowing it on the way up. <laughs> if you might call it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, basically, uh, the, the, the internet the blog led to inquiries. Right. And you decided to write them. Yeah. And then what year was this? Uh, 2008, when the ADA got in touch with me. I, I wrote the proposal over 2009. Uh, I started writing it in uh, the book uh, in late 2009. It was done by uh, February 2010. But here's, may I add one more thing? I've been arguing for a long time. Uh, I published a book in 1994, which nobody's read. Uh, it's called Pragmatism and the Political Economy of Cultural Revolution, in which I use a whole chapter to argue that the Great Depression was caused by a lack of consumption, over saving. Uh, and so I developed that argument in the, in the new book to explain the Great Recession. And I made the explicit comparison between the Great Depression and the Great Recession. Shell, the same for you. Uh, question, concern in your mind that caused you to want to write the book? Okay, is the mic on? <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I come at this from a very different perspective than, than Jim Livingston because I'm not a historian of the United States. I'm actually a historian of Japan. And that's what I've done most of my career. And I originally was going to write a book about Japan exclusively about why the Japanese uh, this was a long time ago, seemed to save so much money. So it was, a, it was an idea that I first started thinking about in the 1990s, and it wasn't clear that Japan was going to be in 20 years of economic stagnation, nor uh, was it clear that the Japanese would actually stop saving money. Uh, so today, the Japanese savings rate is actually below the U.S. savings rate. Uh, so you could say I diversified my portfolio. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I mean, it wasn't just that, uh, but, uh, but I became interested in, in a type of history that's now uh, becoming quite popular called transnational or global history. And I became aware that the Japanese were not freaks in being um, very pro savings uh, from about the late 19th century uh, to the late 20th century that in fact many of the institutions that the Japanese had used to promote saving very aggressively, uh, things like school savings programs and particularly the very famous, infamous uh, Japanese postal savings system, which is today actually the world's largest bank, it's so large, that these things were not unique to Japan at all. Um, any of you who are Europeans in the audience know this, that, uh, that many of the savings institutions and even the idea of savings campaigns were modeled after things that the Japanese in part saw happening in Europe. So then I realized I had a European and a Japanese story, and that was very interesting. Basically, the, the, the history of modern saving. So we think of saving and thrift as something that's kind of old-fashioned, that got displaced by consumer culture. But in a sense, just as consumer cultures were developing in the 1800s, so were modern cultures of people, ordinary people saving in the bank. So that was going to be my book, Japan and Europe. Uh, and then, uh, then I'm finally in sync with Jim Livingston. Um, I was going to do a little bit on the U.S., but I really wasn't quite sure what to do about it. Uh, and then 2008 happened, and all of a sudden it wrote the rest of the book um, because, um, of course, economists and, and, and others uh, uh, had told me all along the way that, um, that the Japanese were idiots uh, for saving. Uh, that the Americans had actually figured out that rather than having small savings accounts, you could invest in assets like land uh, and in the stock market, and you would get these incredible rates of return, and we had a very efficient credit system, and everything was going to be fine. And then 2008 happened, and I realized that housing, as well as consumer credit, was a big part of this history, and what made Americans quite different from both the Japanese and the Europeans. Uh, so that's basically how my book came together. Great. In, uh, Beyond Our Means was published in 2011? So uh, 2000. Yes. Yeah, right at, uh, I think it's probably about the same time oh, as Jim's same book. Time. Uh, uh, November. Yeah, okay. Just in time for Christmas shopping. Just in time. <laughs> and, and, and still, uh, well, no, no, don't, you know, don't, you know just overconsumption shows. <laughs> except for yours. Um, now, quick, four quick questions for you before we go into a little more. I want to have each of you be able to just 
kind of make your main argument. But first, I want to <clears throat> just a quick yes or no. This is a thought experiment. Yes or no? Yes or no. You don't have to. Uh, or, or if you say, I don't know. You know, yes, no, or I don't know. Okay, here's the premise. You are an adult American, and you were living in the early 21st century. I am. That's true. So far. <laughs> What's likely to be the best choice for you personally? More spending or more saving? Um, more spending. Um, no. Oh, it's him. <laughs> you? <laughs> personally. Yes. Uh, well, I have been a saver. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Spending, saving, or I don't know. Uh, probably balance between the two. Oh. <laughs> what's likely to be what's likely to be the what's likely to the, to be the best choice for society overall? More spending or more saving? Uh, in the short term, uh, more spending because this recession doesn't end without that. But I would also go on to say absolutely more spending for uh, long-term balanced growth. This one's complicated. In principle, I agree with Jim that we need more consumer spending now. That clearly would, uh, would help jumpstart the economy. The problem is we've so screwed up our household finances by encouraging over the last 15 years people to spend, spend, but more than spend, to borrow, that they are now in a run up. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, as regards your own personal happiness, what's likely to be more rewarding, consuming or producing? Consuming. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to say? I get a lot of joy out of my work. I'm not sure, I'm a teacher, I'm not sure if I'm producing. Attempts <laughs> <laughs> at producing. As regards the happiness of society overall, what's likely to be more rewarding? More consuming in society or more producing in society? Uh, I would say less producing, for sure, and more consuming. But again, con I mean, consumer culture means to me more than spending things, spending money on things. Okay, that's a great okay. thing. Okay, so we'll get to we'll get yeah. to the we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, same for you. Happiness overall. What's the strategy? More consuming or more producing? Uh, People actually get a lot out of work when their work is rewarding. And I agree with Jim, having read his book, that more and more work is not so rewarding in this country. I think we need to make work more rewarding because I think people actually would enjoy that. Okay. Now, what, what I want to do now is um, have each of you will play one more little, one of these little short things. And then I want each of you to have a chance to kind of just, without me interrupting, lay out your argument. Uh, but Shell, before Jim does that, if you, if you don't want to, don't. But do you, do you feel comfortable in one or two sentences saying what you believe is the thesis of Jim's book? <laughs> I don't feel comfortable with that. Yeah. <laughs> So that would be a no, I wouldn't feel like that. <laughs> I'll do it. All right, okay. I'll do it. Give it a shot. One or, okay. one or two so okay. This is you important. I mean, what you fine. think his yeah. main, uh, if you yeah. want to say his main argument, okay. what you take to be his main point. I think his main point uh, is one that I, I tend to agree with, that there has been a radical shift uh, away from labor, in other words, ordinary working people, toward capital. Uh, and uh, this is the income inequality that we talk about today, and it's a huge problem. I think his main argument is we need to shift that balance more back to the producers. Now, the second part of his argument is against thrift. Uh, I think that's somewhat unrelated, although he obviously thinks it is related. Okay, so take take five minutes uh, and just give us give us your a little more extended version of your main. Argument. Right. If, if I may, I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to pick right up on what Michelle just said. Um, I'll try to suture the two parts of the argument. The, the, the part one of the book is, is a, a, an economic history. It's an explanation of the Great Recession uh, in terms of the Great Depression. 
The argument there is, is, is very, very straightforward, and that is this. Uh, economic growth does not require saving or net private investment and hasn't since 1990. What follows from that, it seems to me, is that if you cut taxes on businesses, if you give more incentives to corporations, all you're doing is accumulating surplus capital. That surplus capital, because it does not have to be reinvested in goods production, because it does not have to be reinvested, it streams into speculative channels, like the housing bubble, or since 1983, any bubble that's available. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, you know, since 1983, since the Reagan tax cuts, we have had a boom-bust cycle, which can be easily solved by redistributing the income away from capital towards labor. That is to say, in, in my terms, uh, away from saving towards consumption. All right, so there's, it seems to me that I've identified the economic problem, I've also identified a, a, a fairly simple solution. We don't think it's simple because we know the politics right now are stacked against us. Part two, though, this is, this is, what, this is a, a problem that I've been trying to, to work on for um, well, 20 years, I guess. And that is, how does one come to the defense of consumer culture? How does one, in effect, defend what we all think of as hedonism? You know, how, do you, how do you go about that? That's what part two of the book is about. I'm not defending hedonism, mind you. I'm, I'm trying to say that consumer culture is a great deal more complicated than spending money on goods. It's about what you do after work. It's about what you do after hours. It's about the moments, the time you spend with your friends, with your family, treating them as ends in themselves rather than means to the end of your career. Uh, so that, well, right, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Now, I guess the, I guess the big problem, though, for me um, is this. Thrift is an attribute of a character type that emerged in the 16th century during the Reformation. Um, and it is still with us. Uh, when markets came to define society, when markets became the means to price and convey property, but at the same moment, when property became the material foundation of the genuine self, of the self-mastering personality, when those two things happened, commerce became both the condition of your genuine selfhood, but also the threat to your character. You had to start saving for a rainy day. You had to have a hedge against the market's vicissitudes, because the market was unpredictable. And it always will be. All right. Now, Max Weber made a very close study of this personality type, this character type. He called it the ascetic personality. Sigmund Freud did the same thing. He called it the anal compulsive or anal erotic personality. And both of them were writing, remember, in the early 20th century. And at that moment, both of them were noticing that alternatives to this character type were emerging. And those character types have continued since the early 20th century to proliferate. So the question for us is not whether these alternatives are emerging. The question is, what is the point of maintaining this character type? Which is, in David's terms and Shell's terms, what is the point of thrift? What are the purposes of thrift? It, 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 this character type treats thrift as almost an end in itself. Why? What are the purposes of thrift? As far as I can tell, the purposes are economic growth. Well, I've already explained to you, saving is bad for growth. So that goes out the window. Social mobility. We used to save, right, because we were wage earners and we wanted to have our own businesses be actually entrepreneurs unto ourselves. That's not how we think of social mobility anymore. So let's look at that one too. Geriatric grace <laughs> or safety. Save for a rainy day. Why? How do you do that? Two ways. You save for a down payment on a house. Why do you do that? Well, you know, houses are okay. They're kind of nice, right? But mainly, what you want to do is form a family. And then you want to be able to pass on that investment to your own kids. You want to be able to help them out when it's time for them to start a family. All right? That purpose is pretty clearly over. Don't think that the housing market is coming back. Not in your lifetime. The average age here, I think, is what? 45? Not in your lifetime? Is there any other children here? Not in their lifetime? Never. The thing is never coming back. It's not worth it 
it's too dangerous, so don't talk to me about geriatric safety by investing in housing. What's the other reason? Retirement. Okay. Now, why would you save for retirement? It seems to me you're a moron if that's what you're thinking. All right? Let me, let me, put, it, let me put it this way. You have to save 20 times your income when you retire to maintain your standard of living. That means you've got to save 5% of your income over 40 years or 15% over 20 years. Anybody doing that? I don't think, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Two people, right, okay. Uh, it's a fool's errand. I lost 35% of my retirement account in six months. So did probably most of you, right? We're putting money in the hands of money managers and bankers who are screwing us. Why don't we socialize, collectivize this problem of retirement, of maintaining people's incomes when their jobs are over or when they can't work? It's, it's, it's insane for us to think about this in individualistic terms. It's a social problem. Let's socialize the solution. All right. All right, what's left then? Geriatric safety, social mobility, <coughs> economic growth, out the window, what's left? The only reason we believe in thrift is because we believe that it forms, it makes our character. Saving for a rainy day is a way of withholding not just emotion, but income from the present. Why do we do it? What is the point? Isn't it time that we actually examine the character type that is invested in saving, in withholding from the present? in the name of a future that can't be known? Isn't it time we got over that? Isn't it time we asked like Weber did, like Freud did, is this really worth it? Are we, are, are we just killing ourselves? Haven't we actually reached the point that Herbert Marcuse predicted in the 1950s and 60s where we, we suffer from surplus repression? We're killing ourselves. For what? Why? Why are we doing this? Why are we withholding all of these resources, our emotions and our incomes, from the present? There's no reason to do it. Unless, of course, you believe that adulthood could only be achieved by this application of surplus repression. Well, pivot on the dime. And in one to two sentences, if you wish, tell what you think is the main thesis of Shell's book. I, I, I am embarrassed to say that I have not read it. So I can't. I'm sorry. You know, I feel like I'm a graduate student. You know, you know, I'm sorry. All right, all right, all right, all right. Shell. Do you want me to make it up? Well, no. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I think I can. Let me make a stab. Um, the economies that grow at rates that facilitate social mobility uh, and equal opportunity, or opportunity that approximates uh, equality, those economies are the ones that uh, save more than they consume. So for example, the Chinese economy right now, between 40 and 50% of the resources of the income available is invested, it is saved as opposed to consumed. Um, and that, is the path to a future in which uh, growth can be balanced against uh, the excesses of, of consumer culture as in the United States. Uh, that, that, okay, all right. um, that argument, it seems to me, has been, has been uh, subverted. Uh, okay. Okay. Only, uh, okay. Have you read your <laughs> Take the similar link yes. yes. and just tell us your main argument. Okay, uh, Jim stated one of several of the arguments, uh, but uh, the main argument is uh, the reason I, I had I was a little frustrated by David's questions originally about mm -hmm. savings versus consumption. Choose one. Uh, this is not actually the way that the real world works. Um, people both save and consume. Uh, anybody who saves everything is going to starve to death. Uh, everyone who consumes everything is actually going to look like an American. Uh, <laughs> and they're going to be in a lot of trouble, as a lot of Americans have been after 2008 when the housing bubble collapsed and they found that they had negative equity and they had no liquid saving. 
Uh, and that is the, the state we're at in America today. Uh, some 43%, even half of the population has little or no liquid saving, and they don't have much more in retirement saving. Uh, so this is a problem. In other words, how to restore the balance. So the book is about how it, it's, it's a global study, as I said, about, about basically about the first world, about Europe, uh, the United States, and East Asia, particularly Japan, but, but China is in there as well. Uh, and it's about, I mean, one, it's not simply an advocacy book, it's, it's, it's an attempt to explain why a lot of other peoples in the first world have focused so much more on saving and Americans have focused much more on spending and credit. So, I mean, it's a historical analysis in that sense. Uh, now, get, getting back to some of Jim's points, though, or at least his interpretation of the book, is, is saving. I, I, I use the word thrift when I'm studying how people used it historically, but I'm, I'm not a big advocate of thrift as a character holder. I'm, a, I'm an advocate of saving as one part of our economic behavior that is balanced against borrowing and spending. Um, so when you put it in those terms, I guess what is saving good for, instead of maybe David's question, what is thrift good for? Uh, well, a, a moderate amount of saving can be very, very useful. First of all, uh, I, I would reject his statement that uh, economies can grow without savings. Uh, we do happen to have had growth. It just doesn't have to come from our savings. It has to come from Chinese and Japanese uh, and, and other people. So, so we have to factor that one. Uh, secondly, we do have to be global. Um, Clearly, a number of economies in Europe and Japan came back after the devastation of World War II, largely based on a lot of saving, even austerity. Dirty word in America, but uh, one that's coming back to some extent in Europe. But a lot of saving in places like West Germany, Japan, France, etc. Uh, so, so we need to keep that in mind. Um, we also need to think at the household level what happens when you don't have any saving? You are in a lot of trouble because Jim has a wonderful utopian prescription that we should socialize uh, consumption and investment. Uh, that is called taxation. I'm a big believer in it. I, I think it, he and I politically are actually quite close together. Uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, and uh, to prescribe to the American people that go on a spending binge, it's going to be life affirming and everything's going to turn out is not true because we have a pretty lousy welfare state in this country in safety nets compared to Europeans. So, I mean, I, I don't want to be harsh, but as I read his book, I knew his politics and they were progressive, but I thought, could he be working for J.P. Morgan? <laughs> <laughs> because that's exactly what they want us to do, to spend and borrow and borrow in a nice predatory way, and they don't care what happens to society. I'm sure Jim does, but, but sometimes when you read the book, I'm not totally sure. Uh, now, one last comment about his remarks, if I may. Um, it's, the word saving economically has a number of variations. Uh, he is talking, when he talks about surplus capital, he's largely talking about corporate saving, which is, as I agree with him, is a problem in this country. There's too much corporate saving because too much wealth is flowed to corporations. He's focusing really on household. What's that? You're talking about personal well, household. And then there is household saving, which I think is quite different. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we probably need less corporate saving. We need more household saving so that people can have independence and invest in their futures, their education, etc. Um, but there's the third type of saving, and that's government saving. And that's taxation, yeah. which he wants, yeah. uh, which I want. Um, but so we need to understand that as, as is consumption is a very tricky term. Because what Americans have tended to do is engage in privatized saving, particularly after World War II. You buy your own car, you finance your own education, you even finance a lot of your own health expenses. Europeans, and to some extent Japanese, tend to socialize their consumption. You have wonderful public transportation systems, fairly low cost education, sometimes even free education, and every first world country in this world has national health insurance. So, uh, Jim talks in his book about um, how consumption is wonderful because it's unforced sacrifice. Anybody who has to spend on cars and car repairs when you're poor because you don't have a public transportation system, anybody who has to spend 
tens of thousands of dollars on student loans, um, this is not tracking consumption or health care. So we need to put all these things in context, I think, and not just tell people to go on spending. Yeah. Hey, may I say I agree with everything Michelle just said, everything, um, uh, including the, uh, the another uh, um, utopian uh, fishers in, in my book. Well, well, let me ask you this. Do you, do you guys, um, they always say a part of, part of um, you know, it's, it's hard to achieve disagreement, you know? In other words, uh, it's easy to debate a straw person. It's easy to, you know, so try to achieve disagreement in a good way. Right? Well, what, do you, what, what, do that? <laughs> what do you think, in, in achieving disagreement also, involves and requires what you two are doing, which is also identifying areas of agreement. Yeah. But, but help us here, take a few minutes, just the two of you, back and forth. I don't even yeah. want to be involved that much. Try to figure out what is the main point, or main one or two points of disagreement between the two of you. It could be, uh, you know, I'm not sure. It could be that I don't think that most of the programmatic uh, statements or urges that, that, that are in the book are, are that utopian. Um, here's, here's an example. Um, Shell's talking about socializing um, savings, that, that Japan and other countries have been able to do this. Um, and, and while I'm at it, I might as well define savings, right? Yeah, household, corporate savings, that's what is withheld from uh, circulation as, as wages, right? So that's profits, dividends, etc. So corporate savings, household savings, and there's government savings. Most, by the way, of the investment component in the national income and product accounts, most of the so-called investment is government spending on the one hand and consumer spending on the other for housing. So bear that in mind uh, when I say that investment is not the driver of growth. All right, now, how would we, how would we go about socializing savings? Uh, it seems like a, a huge task, and it seems, especially in this political climate, to be something almost utopian, except we've already done it. We have already socialized savings. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is subsidized by our taxes. We stand as the guarantors of the bank deposits that we make in commercial banks, all right? The bankers don't. If that is true, and of course it is, I mean, it's, it's incontrovertible, there is no rationale, there's no rational grounds on which to defend the private allocation of those deposits by bankers. We've already socialized this. We've already socialized that risk. We've already also socialized the banks, and the biggest ones as well, with that bailout that we accomplished in 2009 and 2010. We've already socialized these risks. There's no reason for us not to take responsibility for what we already own. For, 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 for individuals, what, what you're proposing is that what is now ex, uh, uh, resides with the responsibility of the individual to save for a rainy day, to open up a, a, an account and, and regularly put money into it. What you want to do is through the system of taxation have the government say for everyone mm -hmm. and therefore alleviating, transferring the activity from the private to the public domain. Not, not entirely. And here's where I think, I think where Shaw has a really good point. And that is, it's not an either or. You know, I wouldn't say that you shouldn't be saving. Of course you'd be saving. Save all you want. Um, just don't make it, a, uh, make it your, your livelihood. Um, I, you know, again, it's not... It's not Someone a, has to do the saving, right? I mean, if No, you actually, somebody doesn't have to do the saving. Because, look, if you save as an individual, it's not going to help you in your retirement. It's not going to help you buy that house, or it's not going to help you maintain the value of that house. So, no. If I you save don't all to, my life yeah. and build up my uh, retirement funds and so forth, mm -hmm. and then I retire, mm -hmm. that money won't help you. Uh, well, if you're like me, you lost almost 40% of it two years ago. So, yeah, where you, you once thought, I mean, look, I, I've, got, I've got less than $600,000 in my, in my retirement account, okay? 
it could have been, had there been no Great Recession, something near $900,000. I need $2 million when I retire to maintain the standard of living at the moment of my retirement. If it's saying that an economic crisis has caused you potentially not to have enough money to retire on mm -hmm. is one thing. But saying that people needn't bother to save for their retirement because it's pointless is another thing. Wouldn't you agree? It sure is. And what I'm saying is that let's not keep putting money in the hands of the bankers. Let's All not right. do that. Or put it in the hands of bankers and supervise them. So you, you're saying that you, the area of disagreement that you pointed to is that you're saying that the prescriptive elements of <clears throat> that we can collectivize a range of activities that have been left to private actors heretofore, and in your view, unsuccessfully yes. and unfairly yes. uh, and, and unevenly achieved, that this is not this utopian uh, uh, pie in the sky idea, but it's actually their precedents in the society now that say that no, a rational society can do this because there are elements of it that are already being done. Okay. Shell, what you can respond to that if you want, but I'm also just interested in your view of where you think the, the main point of disagreement between the two of you is. Well, first I would say Jim is a very lucky guy to have six hundred thousand dollars in his savings. Because I think he should be aware of what an ordinary American has in their retirement saving. Uh, the latest uh, surveys by Progressive Organization has found that three quarters of Americans nearing retirement, that is between 50 and 64 years of age, three quarters of those have an average retirement saving, average, not median, right. average, of only $30,000. But in fact, if you take the median 50% and below, their median retirement saving is zero. Okay, so we have to understand the sort of trouble that people have. Uh, now, the idea that people can retire only on government saving has actually not been tried out in many places. Our social security system was designed to be a three-legged system, as I think you know. Social security plus your private saving plus your, what used to be known as a pension. Now, of course, we don't have many traditional pensions anymore, so it's supposed to be your 401k. Well, the problem is that most Americans don't have two of the legs anymore. Uh, so this is a huge problem. Now, another thing to note is when I said most other places have not actually tried the system of the government entirely in charge of saving, it is very interesting. I think Americans tend to miss this, partly because maybe they don't travel enough. Uh, but if they did, uh, they would <coughs> notice that in Europe, uh, that the super welfare states also have super savings rates. Uh, the Germans, uh, the Austrians, the Belgians, even the Swedes, with their enormous welfare state, have household savings rates now about 12 or 13 percent. Almost most of the ones I mentioned are over 10 percent. So it actually has been a part of the welfare states in these places that, one, the government stands by you as the ultimate resort something I tend to agree with politically, but two, uh, you are expected and enabled to have your own savings, in part, two reasons. One, because the government, as I said, has socialized consumption, great transportation systems, low-cost education, low-cost health care. Uh, but the other thing is that in all these places, governments have actually done a lot, and this goes back 200 years, they have done a lot institutionally to enable people to privately save. Whereas in our country, we had a good period right around World War II and the immediate post-war period, savings and loans, U.S. savings bonds, made it very easy for people to say, we don't do that anymore. Uh, we have a voluntary retirement savings system, which is a mess, doesn't cover half of the people, and the other half don't actually put in much. Uh, we no longer have savings and loans. We don't have a lot of excess banks or uh, lower income people in urban areas. We our banks gouge them, I'm sure you would agree with that. Um, so the Europeans in having interventionist welfare states, they don't just say the government's going to do everything, they're also going to enable the second leg or the third leg of the stool. We do a terrible job of that. So I think 
I, I, I mean, I, okay, again, I don't want to sound harsh, but I think you have a rather naive idea of the relationship of states to private safety. What, what's interesting about what Michelle says, it seems to me, is that uh, notice that there's no um, antithesis between a welfare state on the one hand and very healthy, very robust private savings on the other. That should tell us something about how we can, in fact, socialize savings, socialize risk, socialize the banking system without the danger of, uh, of uh, threatening you know, the, the self-made man, the entrepreneur. Um, question to, for me, then, prompted by Michelle's remarks, why don't we encourage savings? That is to say, what, what are the policies that are in place that discourage a saving? Um, and why is that? As far as I can tell, it's because uh, policymakers understand that it's consumer spending that drives growth, not saving, whether private household savings or corporate profits. Um, these are simply unnecessary, and so there is no point in encouraging them. This is what policymakers understand. Whether they say so or not um, is, is, a, is a different matter. Uh, so that's why we don't encourage it. Now, we could, it seems to be, but on the other hand, what happened to the savings and loans? Back in the day, 1979? We, we deregulated them. Yeah, yeah. So that was a problem. Yeah, we have to reconstruct that system, it seems to be, from the bottom up for anybody to trust it. My, my question is, you know, if the plan, if the concept is that we don't, spending is really what matters, and saving is not important, and that running up, uh, uh, going into debt is not such a big thing to worry about, uh, and that individual acts of self-sacrifice to save for a rainy day and so forth is not really uh, a part of the plan for progress, this seems to me, and the policymakers encourage all this by saying, uh, go out and patriotically spend your money because that will keep the economy going. This seems like a very accurate description of the dominant mainstream worldview of the last 20 years or more. How's that working for us? <laughs> this is a question for you. Well, either of you. I mean, my, my argument would be that it is, it is not, it is, it is not, that is, that view has been shown to have a fail. That's a failed view. I think, I, uh, speaking of naivete, um, I, I think that's a naive explanation for the crisis. I mean, we've, we've heard it from both left and right. Uh, from David Brooks on the right, from David Lennon on the left. Um, sometimes even Paul Krugman uh, goes down the same road. The idea that the Great Recession was caused by consumer excess, I think, is the unstated premise of what you just said. That this policy or this attitude or this uh, demeanor has failed us, both economically on one hand and morally on the other. I would, and the part one of the book is, of my book anyway, not Shell's, uh, is an I'm argument. I'm not saying Shell says that. No, no I would, that was okay. only speaking right. for myself. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's wrong. I think on empirical grounds, uh, consumer excess had very little to do with, I would say, just, you know, let me get really blunt over here and say, had nothing to do with, with the causes of the, the Great Recession. When we denounce consumers for borrowing when they, when they shouldn't have and buying all this junk uh, shipped from China, we're missing absolutely what really happened. And so, I was really just saying that when oh. you have half the country that doesn't have two nickels to rub together in their savings and are in pretty desperate straits, uh, and uh, I was really pointing out that the suffering that people have experienced by being told that uh, they should spend and don't worry about uh, saving. So, uh, do you, I, I interrupted probably wrongly. I'm not asking you to defend what I just said. So, say whatever it is you want to say. Well, okay, a uh, little self-promotional, but, but my book is a, a rather varied and complicated historical analysis of how we got to the point we are in today, and there's no one word. Um, but I will agree with you that um, I'm, not, I'm not targeting consumer excess. That's the effect, not the cause. Uh, what I, uh, okay, so in my book, just in a nutshell, 
And I talk, I start with the 19th century, the 1800s, and I, and, I, and I speak about how institutionally America is considerably different than the institutional promotion of, of saving that you see pursued by the European countries in Japan. Uh, the U.S. has some savings banks. Uh, they have some building and loan associations that turn into SNLs. Uh, but they're very unevenly uh, spread, and in large parts of the country, as late as 1910, uh, Americans had no access, Americans of modest means, had no access to a savings institution, which makes it very hard to save. I mean, if you're putting under the mattress that it has been shown not to be a very effective way of encouraging saving. So that was one problem. Uh, the Americans began to converge to, I think, the institutional promotion of saving in World War II with the savings bond program and also with FDIC, which in a sense really kicks in after World War II and makes the banks safe, which American banks have not been safe before. And of course, that encourages small savers to know that your, your deposits are safe. So there's kind of a golden age of institutional promotion of saving where the US looks a lot like everybody else from the 1940s to uh, through about the 1960s or so. Uh, the big turning point um, is the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, and that's when we have two things happen. One, we have um, the decline of this post-war system of, that made it easy for small savers to save. U.S. savings bonds began disappearing. The SNLs really disappeared because of deregulation. But the other thing that's happening is 1980s financial deregulation, which in my book is maybe the worst thing that's ever happened to us, um, that by unleashing the financial industry with almost no regulation whatsoever, they increasingly engaged in very predatory lending practices. From the credit card industry, which became deregulated and could charge any interest rates and engaged in these untransparent 30-page contracts designed deliberately to ensnare people in debt because that's where the profits came, to the home equity loan, which didn't really exist before the mid-1980s, but was enabled by a tax reform law. And again, nobody really watching in Washington, the sort of predatory lending, the subprime mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. And now the student loan uh, problem, which may be the biggest crisis of all. Um, these were the results of deregulation, and they didn't happen in a lot of other places. They did tend to happen in the English-speaking countries, they didn't tend, they didn't happen in continental Europe, they didn't happen in Japan. Um, they have some of their own problems, but they didn't have this predatory lending wave that resulted, I mean, we still have to remember the 2008 crisis, you know, we think it's all the Europeans' fault today, but we were the trigger. We were the trigger of the fact that the bubble burst, and it was a housing bubble, and it was enabled by very predatory practices by the financial industry. So that's, that's the argument of my book. Um, maybe we're not so far apart. No, I don't think we are. But, but, I, but I'd love to develop it at some, some point of disagreement here. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe here's the way to do it. Um, it seems to me, well, wait here, let me start with the agreement. I couldn't agree more with Shell in thinking that the re-regulation of the financial industry, and I don't mean the reinstatement of Glass Steagall, I think that's, that's yeah. okay, fine, but it's not going to get us very far. But the re-regulation of the financial industry uh, could work. But it seems to me the re-regulation that we would have to establish uh, amounts to, is the equivalent of the socialization of bank assets and the allocation both of risk and reward. So in that sense, I think we're, we're close. On the one hand, you know, I think you know, Shell would say, that, well, that sounds utopian. It seems to me uh, it's, not, it's, it's not really even a choice. It's, it's something that we and we have to do. We have to take responsibility for this business. All right. The other, the other point that he made that I think is really interesting, and here's where we may depart uh, from each other, is that you know, the golden age of saving is the moment between the 1940s and approximately the 1960s uh, in, in, in this country. I did it uh, very well. I did it. I would try to date it more precisely. It lasts from 1933 to 1973. This golden age. Um, for a couple of reasons, and not just because of regulation, but also because the New Deal worked, and worked after the 1930s into the 40s, 50s, 60s. Now, how did it work? Believe it or not, between 1933 and 1937, the fastest growth rates of the 20th century happened, 1933 to 1937. Why? 
It wasn't the financial phase. The banks did absolutely nothing between 1933 and 1937. If you look at the reports of the control of the currency, you will find that between 1933 and 1937, the member banks of the Federal Reserve System increased their deposits with the Fed, that is to say parking their reserves at the Fed, by 150%, and they increased their purchases of government securities over 100%. Meanwhile, 33 and 37, they increased their loans and discounts to private business by 8%. They didn't do a damn thing, in other words, right? There was a huge recovery, again, the fastest annual growth rates in the 20th century, 33 to 37. Think fell off a cliff in 37, of course, because Roosevelt wanted to balance the budget. The point is, how do you explain that? You explain it this way. Uh, net contributions to consumer spending out of federal deficits. The use of taxes, the use of government savings, if you will, to promote consumption. That's how those amazing growth rates took place 33 to 37. And that's how, between 33 and 37, not only consumption drove growth, but as Shell is pointing out, and I think he's right about this, yeah, savings too. It's the golden age of both savings and consumption. Why? Because the welfare state, as we like to either call it or, or criticize it, um, mattered. It worked. Question? Yeah, I was just on 33, 37, I heard right. The yeah. banks had more money to lend out, mm -hmm. and they were lending out more money. You don't think it had anything to do with just inflation, or just the fact that the Fed just prints money and book this, this is what we've posited? No. It had nothing to do with the I don't, so. I don't think so. We, we left the gold standard, that's, that's for sure. And Christine Romer. Yeah, uh, what gets you all inflation is what gets you all inflation is the fact that you can get a gold, you have enough in the whole tree to work money, you just print your way out of everything, and you make the dollar worthless. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, I think I think Christina Romer, of all people, agrees with you. She was she was Obama's first choice for the, the, the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, she wrote a piece uh, a long time ago, which she said that the, the New Deal couldn't explain the growth rates of 33 to 37, and she ascribed it to leaving the gold standard and inflation. So, so I mean, so you might be arguing for inflation. You might be saying that inflation, 33 and 37, uh, was a cause of growth. I want to thanks, but I want to bring the mic. Okay. Okay.